with the gospel. So check that out if you're interested in becoming a community ambassador. With that, pull out your crosswalk notes. I'm going to dive in. Time is running quickly, and I want to run with it. I remember the day my mom died very clearly in my mind. I was no, nowhere near her. I had been a week and a half, two weeks earlier. But when my mom died, and she'd been ill a long time, she, she died of cancer. She had been in hospice for a little while. And I, I think I had kind of just kind of pushed away the reality of her impending death. Uh, while, while she was laying in hospice, I had been asked a year, year and a half earlier to make a trip to Nigeria to teach people there uh, about the gospel, about Jesus. And I debated it. I, I thought, my mom, she's close to death. Should I, should I pull the plug on this last moment? And, and I decided that I would go ahead with the trip to Nigeria, convincing myself my mom would still be there when I got back. She was not. In the smack in the middle of this trip to Nigeria, um, some Nigerian men came up to Charlie and me, the two missionaries, the two of us. We were long-term friends. We had been together in Zambia. And they said, Pastor Jeff needs to go into town. Now, town was not something you did just um, all in and of itself. It was far enough away that it was a little bit of a trip. And uh, if you've ever driven in Nigeria, which I'm guessing most of you haven't, it's a risk just to get in a car there and go anywhere. So we drove into town, um, made a phone call, and that's when I discovered that my mom had passed away. Immediately, I remember the feelings that, that flooded. What well, You know, you dummy. Why did you go ahead with this trip when you knew that your mom was dying? She was already in hospice. You, you must have just been in complete denial. And, and feelings of guilt um, flooded my heart, my mind. Uh, doubt, should I just pack up and go home right now or do I stay for another week, complete this trip? which ultimately is what I ended up doing. But I can tell you that the only thing in that time, in those days, that were a comfort to me, uh, the, the things that most comforted me had to do with eternity. What you may or may not know if you've heard me speak is that I spent 25 years after I became a Christian, I, I've described for you how my folks were party people, I spent 25 years connecting my mom up with pastors and, 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 and friends of mine that I knew would share the gospel with her. And she resisted and she resisted and she resisted until about five years before she died. And then she started attending the equivalent of what here at Crosswalk is a 201 class under uh, a friend who's a pastor of mine and went through that entire class and, and became a Christ follower, became a believer. And the thing that finally just erased my guilt and comforted me in all of this is that my mom had died, her soul had separated from its body, but she would rise again. That's the promise. Jesus says, I'm the resurrection and the life, that I would see her again, that, that eternity was on the horizon for both her, her, my mom, and for me. And so this wasn't the end of our journey together, not by a long shot. In fact, the journey that we had had together so far was merely a blip. That because of the promise of heaven through Jesus Christ, good things, great things were ahead for my mom and me. Only an eternal perspective brought me comfort, relieved my guilt and my shame for, for not being there at my mom's bedside when she died. And through that experience, I learned how powerful having an eternal perspective is in life. Because life has so many different challenges, sometimes big ones, sometimes small ones that we have to face. And we are so good as human beings at catastrophizing things. You know what I mean by catastrophizing? You love that word, you have to love that word. Catastrophizing, let's all say it together. Catastrophizing, you know what that means? You make a catastrophe 
out of almost everything. You take an anthill and turn it into Mount Everest. And, and because, and it's not, you know, some of you are saying, oh, he's talking about me. No, I'm talking about all y'all and myself. Because there's, there is an aspect, there are certain areas in all of our lives where we tend to worry and get anxious. And, and when something happens in that area, moms, it might be, for, for you, it might be your children. Uh, men, for you, it might be something going wrong at, at work in your career path. Husbands and wives, it might be your relationship. Those of you who aren't married yet, it might be the relationship that you're in, that you're wondering, where is this going? And it feels like a catastrophe when it's not going according to the plan that you've made for it. See, we all have areas in our lives where we tend to take molehills and turn them into mountains. And that's why this message is so huge. Because when we are given this beautiful eternal perspective that God gives us, that this life is not all there is, that there is much, much more for us through Jesus Christ, it allows us to steady things out and, as Paul says here, keep our heads in in all situations. And it starts with the change, which is, which is why Spider-Man is almost the, the perfect superhero for this because if you if you know the story of superman he he was not doing well in in school he was the school nerd his his parents had passed away in a horrible accident he was being raised by his uncle and aunt who loved him very much and took care of him but he was this skinny kid in high school no girlfriend science nerd and the people all around him picked on him. If you've watched the movie, you know that there was this character called Flash. And Flash didn't just pick on Peter Park, he picked on everyone. Picnic table, he would love to take kids and dump them upside down into the garbage can next to the picnic table where the kids ate lunch. That's the kind of guy Flash was. And he constantly was picking on Peter Parker because he was the school nerd. One day, Peter Parker gets bitten by a radioactive spider and he becomes filled with all these new powers and abilities. He becomes Spider-Man. All of a sudden, he's got agility and strength. He's got these massive reflexes. He can stick to walls and even to ceilings. He's got his spidey sense. That spider bite, in a moment, changes everything for Peter Parker. Except for one thing. Remember the movie? If you've watched the movie? See, what doesn't get changed right away, even though Peter Parker gets these new powers and this new strength and agility and reflexes, is Peter's heart doesn't change right away. What happens in one of the the early scenes in the movies is that Peter Parker, shortly after he's, he's given these powers, goes into a convenience store, and a guy robs the store, and, and Peter doesn't stop him. And shortly thereafter, the guy who robbed the convenience store that Peter did nothing about just kind of stood by. In fact, in fact, he, he, the, the robber throws him the drink that Peter Parker was trying to buy, but he was a couple of cents short kind of benefits from the robbery. Shortly thereafter, the robber ends up killing this uncle who was raising him and who had loved him dearly. You you know, the old saying, all it takes for evil to succeed is for good good men and women to stand by and do nothing. That's what Peter Parker had done in that moment because even though he had the strength and the agility, he didn't yet have the heart change that he needed to have to truly be Spider-Man. What a great lesson for us. As we look at the book of Colossians, I mentioned before we're in Colossians chapter 3 this morning. It's interesting because do you know who the author of this book is? It's the Apostle Paul. 
And the Apostle Paul has a similar transformation moment. Now, he wasn't bitten by a spider. He was bitten by the Jesus bug. And he got bitten by the Jesus bug when he was on the road to Damascus, trying to fight Jesus, trying to resist Jesus, trying to attack those who follow Christ, trying to put them in jail, even execute them. He had already done it. He had executed someone by the name of Stephen, who's known as the very first Christian martyr. It says Paul stood by and supervised that death while Stephen was stoned because of his Christian faith. Jesus encounters Paul in, in, in bright light as Paul's making his way to Damascus, a good long journey away from Jerusalem where, where Paul was headquartered. And he, and he confronts Paul on the road and he says, Paul, why, why are you persecuting me? And he appears to Paul if you know the story, I'm not going to go into it very deeply. I'm going to kind of skim it. Paul has this exchange with Christ, and he's blinded by it. Paul's companions end up taking him into Damascus, where he remains blind for a few days until a gentleman by the name of Ananias comes and heals him and restores his sight. And when that happens... Because of this encounter with Christ on the road and because of the scales falling from his eyes the scales also fell from his heart. And, and in, those, in that several day period, Paul went from someone who was fighting and resisting Christ in his heart to someone who radically embraced Christ with his heart and with his mind. Years later, Paul then became a missionary and it became his goal in life to get others to radically embrace Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior with all their minds and with all their hearts. And as we read this, we're reading a letter that the Apostle Paul, the same gentleman who was bitten by the Jesus bug on the road to Damascus, we, we see Paul writing to people that he wants to be just as passionate about the cause of Christ as he is. You know what's beautiful about this? Sitting in this church today are people all over the spectrum just like the people in Colossae were. There, there are some in this room that are new to the Christian faith, maybe so new, they're, they're still wondering, what am I going to do with this? Do I, do I really believe this? I'm not sure yet. There are some of you who have, on the other end of the spectrum, been Christians for so long that it's just kind of become old hat to you. And when you hear words like passion and enthusiasm and all in, you're like, whoa, 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 pastor, I got a lot of things on my mind. You want me to be all in? You want my heart to be all for Christ? You, you Pastor Jeff, are saying that I've got to give 100% of me to Jesus? How's that going to work? In this life. And now I, you know, I've been a Christian for a long time, Jesus. I know it can work very well to give Jesus 75%. I know it can work to give Jesus 50 or even 25%, just as long as I hang in there. There are people in this room, just like there were people in Colossae, there are people who have heard God's word and they know it very well. You can, you can quote Bible passages. You can tell me the history of the Old Testament. You can list the kings in order. You can tell me what Jesus' ministry was all about. You can tell me what the book of Acts was all about. You can lay out the entire story. Some of you are so well-versed in scriptures, you know what the book of Revelation has to say to you. But you haven't yet begun to apply it to your hands and your feet, your mouth, your mind, and most of all, your heart. You haven't figured out yet that these words are really true, not just in some sort of dusty historical sense, but true for you right now as something to actually live by every day. Something that is transformative, in other words. Something that changes you in your heart, in your mind, and, and in your behaviors as well. 
And that's what Paul is writing to the Colossians because all those people that I just described as being here were in Colossae as well. And he's essentially saying to us, if you have an eternal perspective, that's going to transform your entire life. It's going to be like me before and after. Picture a spiritual picture of, of Paul when his, his name was Saul before he became a Christ follower. Spiritual picture of Paul after. You, Paul is saying, if you're bitten by the Jesus bug, ought to be experiencing the same kind of dramatic transformation. Now, the timing might not be as dramatic. So I want to be clear on that. For Paul, it was boom, dark to light. And it was very much an overnight thing. Not to say that he didn't keep on learning and growing. He, he, he learned and he grew for his entire life. For some of you, it's not that dramatic, especially if you were baptized as a small baby, as we saw today. You've been a Christian for a long time. But the transformation, the, the end result between dark and light should be just as dramatic, Paul says. Why? Let's look at the very first verse, Colossians 3.3. 3. For you died, you died to your old way of life, and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. I want you to write this down. You have been bitten by the Jesus bug, and the after effects of that bite transform your entire life. Now, my question for you is, has it? And is that transformation every bit as dramatic as what Peter Parker experienced? Every bit as dramatic as what the Apostle Paul experienced? And I'm not talking about the pace. It doesn't have to be an overnight transformation. I'm simply talking about the depth of the transformation. Has your heart changed? Has your mind changed because you've been bitten by the Jesus bug? Have your actions changed? Your attitudes changed? Do you find yourself to be more joyful today? More at peace? Living more in forgiveness and grace than guilt and shame? Do you, do you see hope for the future? And most of all, here's what Paul is saying. What's your sense of calm when life gets tough? Because that's when it's really tested. When life happens. You know what I mean, right? When life happens. Can you still remain calm and steady? And keep your head. You see, we're talking today about a helmet of salvation, aren't we? Why do you wear a helmet? To keep your head in battle. Because guess what? What is the major part that your enemy is always aiming for with his sword? Cut off the head. Your enemy's done. Even today, when we talk about masses of enemies and terrorists, you will constantly hear military strategists say, we go after the leaders so that we can cut off the, say it louder. Satan's the greatest military strategist you're ever going to meet. He wants to take your head off. That's why we have to put on the helmet of salvation. The helmet that says, I have an eternal perspective, not just all drilled down into the specifics of today only. And that transforms our entire life. Okay, let's back up to verse one. That's verse three. I put it up there at first because to me, that's the, that is the core verse. You died and your life is now hidden with Christ in, in, in God. It, everything changed. And you have your own uniform and it's Christ. Since then, you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts where? Help me. On things above. What are the things that Paul says care most about these? Things here? No. Care most about heaven. Care most about what's coming in the next life. Care most about the things above. Where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. He ascended into heaven and he's seated at the right hand of God controlling everything. Now, not just set your hearts there, Paul says. Also set your, help me out, 
Mine's there. Take your heart, place it on the table called eternity. Take your mind, place it on the table called eternity, and and keep it there. Care most about eternity and heaven, things above, not on earthly things. Why? Here comes verse 3. We already looked at it. Because you died to the old way of life that is consumed by what's happening to you right now. Consumed about possessions and, and, and earthly glory and climbing the ladder and making sure that you've got enough money in your account. Paul's going to quote some other things in just a moment. But just for example, a couple of those things. Think about the Apostle Paul. Now, it wasn't just earthly possessions for him. As a Pharisee, he loved the praise of people. Maybe that's your earthly thing. It might not be a physical possession, but you just crave the attention of people. You crave being praised and honored and glorified. You love thinking highly of yourself because you look at yourself as a good person who's obedient to God. That was the whole Pharisee mindset. You know how I can be self-confident? Obey God's law. And they fooled themselves into thinking they were actually doing it so that they could feel good about themselves. Those were earthly things, Paul says. Forget about those. You died to that way of life, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You're just like Spider Man wears a uniform that hides who he is, your uniform is Jesus Christ. Your superhero outfit is to clothe yourself in the righteousness of Jesus Christ so that when everybody else looks at you, they see Jesus, not you. That's your superhero uniform. Your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is your life, will you draw a line between Christ and life and circle both of those words? See what he's saying? Money's not life. Possessions are not life. Human relationships and love are not life. The honor of people, the respect of people, climbing the ladder, guys, those are not life. What's life? according to Paul. Help me, what's life? Christ. Knowing Christ as your savior, Paul is saying, that's life. And nothing else matters, not really. Because what's here is merely a blip. Paul makes a promise. When Christ, who is your life, appears when he comes back, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul's saying to the Colossians, and he's saying to us, there is a massive, huge battle for your heart and your mind going on. You feel it. You know it. Even as you hear me preach, I'm sure there are some of you at least, maybe just one or two, saying, yeah, pastor, but... Because there's a constant battle for your heart and your mind to take it away from eternal things. That's why Paul addresses it. So what's the first thing that gets changed when you believe in Jesus? You have a transformed goal. Eternal glory is the new goal. Not building up stuff here, building up stuff for heaven. Eternal glory is the new goal. Now Paul says... If you have a transformed goal, you have transformed priorities as well, and you begin to line up life according to this new goal of eternal glory, and you become willing to do something truly radical, you become determined to start the pruning process. If your faith is a vine, and it is, that wants to produce fruit, Any of you who are familiar at all with vineyards, you know you cannot produce fruit without pruning. Paul says we got to begin the pruning process. We got to have the right priorities. And look at how strong the language is here. Put to death, therefore. 
whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Cut that off. Throw it in the fire. And what things is he talking about? Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life you once lived, that old life that you've died to. You used to do those things, but now, will you circle those words? But now you must also rid yourselves. Strong language. Put it to death. Rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other. Since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, taken off your Peter Parker clothes and you put on your Spider-Man costume, Jesus Christ And that renews you. You have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Write this down. The the second thing that gets absolutely transformed in the Christ follower's life is his priorities, her priorities. Transform priorities. And I am now ready to eliminate, assassinate, throw away into the dump anything. Prune away anything that gets in the way of the true goal. What does Paul mention here? Sexual immorality, impurity, and lust. Wow. Are you ready to eliminate that? In today's world, are you ready to eliminate that? I really hope so. It's one of the biggest struggles we have in our culture right now. So many people are trapped in this. Paul says, prune it. Evil, greedy desires that lead to idolatry. The things that you want, physical, earthly, Paul says those are dumb things because they're not eternal. You're just being greedy, and those things are idols in your life. You think they're going to protect you. You think they're going to help you. You think they're going to serve you, but you're going to end up serving them. Emotional baggage or lack of emotional control. You read this. Rid yourselves of all such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander. Paul says you got you to get rid of the emotional baggage. If you're feeling guilt and shame over things that you've done in the past, give it to Jesus. If you're struggling to stay calm in all situations, give it to Jesus. Lack of verbal filters and motor mouth disease. Notice what he says here. Slander and filthy language from your lips, Paul says. He would include things like gossip and backbiting. Dishonesty and lack of transparency, he says. Don't lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its practices. When we as brothers and sisters in Christ can't come clean with each other, when we can't be real, when we can't be honest because we're too afraid of protecting our reputation, what do we acknowledge up here when we baptize every last time? We're all sinners. What do we have to protect? We're all bad. We're all evil. And don't let the world tell you, you're a good person. You're not a good person. I'm not a good person. Not by nature. The only thing that leads me down the road of hope that I, that I can grow into being a good person is Jesus and the transformative power that he brings to my heart and my mind. So come clean. Be honest. Find people you can trust. Growth groups, whatever it might be. Flip the page. I got a motor. Here's the last thing that gets transformed. Your relationships. Notice what Paul says at the very end of this section. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now hear me loud and clear. Look, look around you in the room. You see people that are older than you? 
See people that are younger than you? You see people that are a different color than you? Different background going up, maybe different nationality or ethnicity? Different job? We can make so much of those stupid, petty, earthly differences, and that's all they are. Paul says, here in the church, where Christ is all, and he is in all of us, that's all that matters. Look around, and, and really what Paul says we should see is not differences, but one key, most important similarity. We should see Jesus in every heart and mind, in every person in this room. We should look around and say, that's a Christ follower, that's a, a brother, that's a sister in Christ, and I love them. I love them with all their faults and all their foibles and all their weirdness. Man, that person is just crazy and nutty, but I love them. I love them. I might be talking about the person sitting right next to you. And I might be talking about someone sitting down the row behind you or ahead of you. But we are family and our different. Look at what he says. There is no. Will you circle that word? There's no Gentile. Man, these were differences that deeply split the people that Paul was writing to. And he's writing to the Colossians and he's saying, stop that. That doesn't exist for us anymore. It's not real. There's no Gentile, Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised. He even mentions Scythians. You're, you're looking at that going, what? Scythians, really? What's a Scythian? Well, a Scythian was, were the people that in Paul's day in the Roman Empire were the most barbaric, uncivilized people that you could imagine. That was their reputation. Paul says, take the dirtiest, nastiest, smelliest, most unshaven, most unbathed, poorest, nastiest person that you can imagine Put Jesus in them, that's your brother, that's your sister. Love them. They're not any different from you. Write this down. An eternal perspective transforms relationships. Pride on the one hand that causes me to look down on someone else, but the opposite is also true. Some of us are suffering from what I would call an inferiority complex. We don't feel worthy. And that, that happened here too. Paul says, stop it. You are worthy because Christ is in you. There should be no inferiority complex. There should be no thoughts of I'm not worthy. You are worthy. Christ's blood makes you worthy. Transform relationships, pride, inferiority complex, and whatever divides or isolates are replaced by Christ. Transform goals, transform priorities that causes us to say no to anything that might snag us up from heaven. And now transform relationships. We are in this crowd going on this same journey together, brothers and sisters together, united as one. Paul says, that's going to help you keep your head in all situations. Therefore, he says in Ephesians 6.13, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, you're going to stand your ground. Because you've got the helmet of salvation on. You've got the full armor of, of God on. You're not going to get knocked on your butt quite so easily when it comes to spiritual matters. Your guilt, your shame, your feelings of unforgiveness, your, your, your feeling like you're inferior or superior in some way, that will not knock you on, on your butt. No, because you will stand wearing this armor, this helmet of salvation. Paul goes on and he writes the same thing to the Romans. So we see Ephesians, we're going to see Romans, we saw it in Colossians. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We're going to heaven. Brothers, we're going to heaven. Sisters, we're going to heaven. We're conquerors through Jesus who loved us. 
And I'm convinced that nothing can stand in our way, not with Jesus at our side, not with Jesus inside of us, not with the Jesus uniform of righteousness on. I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Write this down. Jesus assures us of our eternal destiny, and that assurance allows us to keep our heads in all situations. Have you heard this before? Remember, I started this by saying we have a tendency to catastrophize, to make catastrophes out of things, to make mountains out of molehills. 40% of what you turn into a catastrophe, 40% of what you worry about is off in the future, and studies show that 40% is never going to happen. Almost half of what you're worrying about right now, what you're catastrophizing right now, it ain't ever going to happen. Another huge chunk, 30%, 30% of what you're worried about already went down. It spilt milk. You can't change it. And worrying isn't going to help because it's done. Another pretty good chunk, 12%, is about other people. What other people think of me, what other people are doing, people that you have absolutely no control over, and you're worrying about them, even though you can't control them. What are we up to now? 40 plus 30 plus 12. That's 82%. Another 10% is about health issues. What does worry do when you have a health issue? Make it better? No, it ain't going to help. It's going to make it worse. So how much does that leave for real problems? Out of all the stuff that you worry about, that you can control, control and do something about it that you can change of it how much of all the worries that you're that you're putting yourself through every day is actually something you can change less than one in ten eight percent and you're catastrophizing it i'm catastrophizing it but here's the beauty of the eternal perspective what does the eternal perspective say jesus already died for my sins Jesus already gave me heaven. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's the most well-known passage in the whole Bible. You and I will not perish but we'll have eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. You and I who are Christ followers know that there is a better place that we're going to for eternity called heaven. And all this stuff down here We should start taking mountains and turn them into molehills. We should start taking catastrophes, Paul says, and turn them into big fat zeros, nothings. We should learn not to be catastrophizers, but diminishers. And the way we learn how to do that is asking this simple question, is this going to affect my eternity? And unless the answer is yes, Paul says, Stop worrying about it. Stop thinking about it. Because if it's not going to affect your eternity, it really doesn't amount to anything. And you don't have to worry about it. That's the helmet of salvation. The helmet of salvation. When Paul says, take the helmet of salvation, he is saying, ask yourself daily this question. Will this affect my salvation? Yes, All right, it's important. No? Forget about it. Because it's not that key. Take the helmet of salvation, and he writes to Timothy, but you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship. Write this down. Satan is always aiming for our heads. The helmet of salvation transforms goals, priorities, and relationships, and helps us keep our heads in all situations. 
Here's the verse I want you to memorize to, to keep you coming back to that eternal perspective. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. And remember, this is today's bottom line. I'm no, I no longer have to lose my head in tough situations. I'm protected by the helmet of salvation, the assurance that Jesus has already won eternal glory for me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much that you have sent your son Jesus to win eternal salvation for us. We thank you for baptism that brings us into your eternal kingdom. Thank you for these four beautiful girls that were baptized today, and we ask you to bless them. Bless them especially with faith in Jesus as their Lord and Savior throughout their entire life. Give them parents that raise them up to know Jesus. Give them a church like Crosswalk that can help those parents. Lord, that's just one example. Well, four examples. But all of us in this room need to be given this eternal perspective. Lord, we cannot do it on our own. We constantly want to drift back to the old way of life. We are sorry for the times when we do that, Lord. We repent of that and we ask for your forgiveness. Now, Lord, give us the power of your Holy Spirit to lead us forward into a transformed life with transformed goal, eternal glory, transformed priorities so that we're willing to prune off and say no to anything that doesn't lead to eternal glory. And finally, Lord, transform relationships where the petty differences that we have in this life we realize they mean nothing because Christ is in our brothers and sisters. Lord, we pray fervently for these things because we want this to be a church filled with people that are truly and dramatically transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.